on the 13th of April this year, 600 British paratroopers from 16 Air Assault Brigade jumped alongside 1,500 US paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division, all of them dispatched from 23 UK and US aircraft. This massing of combat power marks the start of the Combined Joint Operational Access exercise, the largest of its kind for almost 20 years. It also represented a significant step along the way to full interoperability between the two formations, in line with a bilateral vision statement signed in March 2013 by the then Chief of the General Staff, General War, and the Chief of Staff of the US Army, General Odierno. This inter interoperability is not, of course, an end in itself. Rather, it offers political choice and compelling options, in this case, for London and Washington's decision makers in a future that is likely to include a myriad of extraordinary threats. The 82nd Airborne Division's interoperability program has brought 2nd Brigade Combat Team and 16 Air Assault Brigade from the British Army together in training over the last two years. The two nations are conducting combined training between their elite, highly deployable, quick response forces to create solutions to key functional differences, knowing that future conflicts will not be fought unilaterally. The years of training have led up to the largest multinational exercise at Fort Bragg in nearly 20 years. The Combined Joint Operational Access exercise has been a seven-week exchange between the British and the Americans on the end of two years of work about interoperability, so that a UK battalion, plus all of its assets, can operate inside a US BCT. So this was a seven-day exercise, beginning with the Joint Forcible Entry last Monday, that saw 2,100 paratroopers exiting from 23 aircraft, including two British aircraft, uh, onto a drop zone. That was the first major uh, waypoint that we had to hit. The British battalion plus size element joined two BCT weeks prior for preparation to endure the same rigorous 96-hour sequence pre-deployment process the brigade would undergo in the event of their call to action as the nation's global response force. The leading operations in the exercise placed 3rd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment under mission command of the U.S. Brigade, but the final offensive operation put U.S. elements under the direction of the 3 Power Commander. Watch out, lads! 3 Power received this mission to destroy this training camp two days ago from Colonel Ryan. In order to achieve that mission and to prosecute it successfully, I could only do it with a series of U.S. combat enablers, a rifle company human enablers, tactical psyop teams, EDSL team. When you combine all of those enablers, plus the aviation element to get us into the fight, add that to free power and what we bring to the fight, and you've got a very, very capable and powerful force able to achieve the full mission set. Communication is a major focus area during the planning and tactical portions of the training and is vital to information control and distribution. I need your location, over. Mission command is uh, many times, even unilaterally, our, our defeat mechanism. If we don't do it well, we're going to lose. Um, so we pay a lot of attention to it when we are uh, working our interoperability issues with the UK. Let one six push one kilometer to the west. One of our uh, baseline components is what we call the EDSLT concept, uh, Expeditionary Digital Support Liaison Team. Uh, that's a component that we add to 3Para. The units have been successful in integrating enabler assets to one another's ranks, but the leadership continues to look forward towards an even greater advance in interoperability. Uh, in order to get truly interoperable, we have to get away from adding the people and just making sure the UK forces have the system. We took a uh, few strides toward that objective during this exercise. We've got some more to go to really get to where we want to be. Three, two, one, go! West way, that way! My name is um, Lieutenant Colonel John Clark, and I command the Parachute Engineer Regiment in 16 Air Assault Brigade but I've also been charged with the staff leads on this important project from the UK perspective. 
Uh, also in the audience, uh, and more informed than I, are uh, Major General Hill, the, the General Officer Commanding 1st United Kingdom Division, who was the Deputy Commanding General of the 82nd Airborne Division during this exercise. Uh, also, Colonel Graham Livingston, the Brigade Deputy Commander, just to my right, uh, and Colonel Mike Shervington, uh, who featured uh, several times in that video, who was the CO of 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, and led our part participation in that exercise. Um, we'll hopefully be able to ask, answer any of your detailed questions uh, at the end. We also have a number of um, officers and soldiers from across the brigade in the, uh, in, the, in the combat uniform who, again, will be able to share their experiences with you throughout the rest of the day. Um, before I get into the detail, I should point out that what I'm about to explain to you sits alongside several other very important interoperability projects for the UK, not least our partnership with the French Armed Forces. We recognize that we are unlikely to go to war on our own in the future, and I know the same is true of the US military. Furthermore, it's not just 16 Air Assault Brigades and the 82nd Airborne Division that are engaged in this work, but the US and UK armies across the spectrum of conflict. What I offer you today is an example of progress in a key capability area, that of joint forcible entry. I must also mention that we're not just talking about combined capability, i.e. US and UK armies, but joint capability. The Royal Air Force and the US Air Force were key to the success of this exercise and are an intrinsic part of the capability. So what was the exercise all about? The first thing to say is that the exercise represented part of the continuum of a relationship that has endured since the trenches of World War I, almost 100 years ago, and gained great strength and meaning through the Second World War and most recently a decade of campaigning in Iraq and Afghanistan. Furthermore, it represented the culmination of at least two years' work on this particular project, amplifying the strengths and bridging capability gaps with all of its attendant benefits. The specific objectives of the exercise are shown on the slide, from which you will recognize the level of ambition involved. How did we do? The headline is that the 2nd Brigade Combat Team in 3Para, under the command of the 82nd Airborne Division, conducted a successful joint forcible entry mission rehearsal at night in challenging terrain and with fierce resistance. The point is that this capability exists today. The UK's Air Assault Task Force is ready to deploy on operations alongside the US 82nd Airborne Division as part of a combined joint crisis response force held at very high readiness. Beneath this, I would highlight five areas of significant progress. Firstly, combined joint force entry by air maneuver. I've given the headlines, but in slightly more detail, the exercise saw UK paratroopers jumping from US aircraft and vice versa. Similarly, there were mixes in terms of parachuting equipment and the parachutes themselves. In terms of air assault operations, we saw a UK light gun being airlifted into position by a US Black Hawk helicopter, for example. And in terms of air landing operations, we had US and UK C-130 aircraft landing on runways that had been cleared and repaired by combined teams of US and UK military engineers. In terms of heavy drop, we saw similar levels of integration in the dispatch of equipment. From the UK perspective, we were able to parachute our light guns, Pinsgauer vehicles, quad bikes, and our containerized delivery system was also used successfully by the US Air Force. We had significant success in the area of joint fires, which was genuinely combined and joint. US guns firing on UK designated targets and vice versa. Perhaps most significantly, the coordination measures to manage the battle space were efficiently executed. I've spoken briefly about the combined airfield damage repair, but the levels of interoperability achieved were impressive, mixed operators and teams combining to great effect. I would also note that the exercise was used as the proving ground for a new UK air droppable airfield damage repair capability. Finally, and very significantly, the levels of interoperability achieved between the US 18th Air Force and the Royal Air Force's 47th Squadron were, in the context of recent history, groundbreaking. The initial insertion saw 21 aircraft comprising 12 US C-130, 2, two UK C-130, and, and 7 C-17, dropping around 2,000 troops in two waves over one period of darkness. More broadly, throughout the exercise, the air elements were able to execute large force element training on a scale we have not seen for some years. 
Looking back at the objectives, what did we actually achieve? This slide shows some of the more detailed objectives broken down by the warfighting functions. Well, I'll not go into the detail of these now, but please feel free to ask any of them during the question and answer session. And the other thing I'd point out is that although these are based on the warfighting functions, we do have other objectives that are the cross-cutting challenges that General McMaster spoke about uh, earlier this morning. But in overall terms, we demonstrated UK battle group para with any US brigade parachute assault. We conducted collaborative planning and the execution of operations, combined joint fires, including UK light gun being heavy dropped, as I've explained, combined sustainment and combined arms maneuver. So in large part, realizing those uh, chief objectives. There's no doubt that there's more work to do, particularly in the area of mission command, uh, often the UK, in UK parlance, the uh, C2, and also in intelligence. But the point is that the testing nature of the exercise allowed us to expose capability gaps and areas we need to continue to work on in the future. And what of that future? As with any project of this nature, there are a large number of stakeholders. This slide attempts to lay out the stakeholder map from a 16 Air Assault Brigade perspective. This is important as it highlights our role in the plan. While we concentrate on the inter interoperability planning shown in the middle of the diagram, we are conscious both of the higher level army planning going on on both sides of the Atlantic and the lower level unit to unit level activity that is in many ways the most meaningful in that it builds the relationships that enable us to fight through the frictions. It's also worth noting the validation and gap analysis work at army level that our project hopes both to inform and to benefit from. So how does this work in practice? I appreciate that this slide won't be clear to all of you but I put it up to highlight that there is considerable science that's being applied to this process. At the bottom, you can see where we believe, believe the capability laps lie across the warfighting functions, noting that these gaps span the defense lines of development. The gaps are then sent against existing training opportunities, a chronological line, line running left to right across the top of the slide, so that we have a clear plan to close the gaps and a clear idea of what capabilities we will have available, available to us and when. The other point to make here is that it's very much an iterative process. While the UK battle group, working within a US brigade combat team, which was achieved on the exercises I just explained, and the UK's air assault task force operating along the US 82nd Brigade's global response force are significant milestones, this is a continuous journey of improvement. You will all recognize that true interoperability requires sustained effort and investment. All of this is also bound up in the integration of new capabilities not least in the UK's case, the introduction of the new A400M aircraft that will significantly enhance our lift and reach. The next point to make is that this work is not necessarily resource intensive, and this plays to CGS's direction in terms of operating and training smarter. This slide shows the elements of the training cycle of the Air Assault Task Force, including the aviation elements. The gray boxes represent the op opportunities we have identified for US force elements to join in with existing training opportunities. Some of this is combined arms, some special to arm training, such as joint fires, I-STAR, logistics and engineering. At the higher collective training levels, of course, much can be achieved through simulation and command post exercises. Similarly, there are a number of US training activities, not least the JOAC series, and JRTC rotations that provide ideal opportunities for combined joint exercises. The bedrock of this program is an annual formation level exercise, either a field training exercise or a command post exercise on rotation that will allow for the training and validation of this capability. Beneath all of this is a vibrant program of exchange and liaison posts, unit to unit level activity, particularly among the supporting arms and individual training courses that build this capability from the bottom up. I should note that many of the opportunities shown on the slide are aspirational at this stage. By way of summary, US-UK combined joint capability was proven on the Sea Joax exercise. Three para battle group working alongside the second brigade combat team supported by joint enablers conducted a successful joint forcible entry mission. Over the next few years, the capability will be grown to include the command and control elements of the full Air Assault Task Force and its rotary wing and fixed wing aviation elements. 
Underwritten by the bilateral statement signed uh, or mentioned earlier, the four waypoints of US-UK interoperability will see a UK brigade operating within a US division, a UK division within a US corps, a US brigade combat team operating in a UK division, and a US division within the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps. These waypoints will generate military and therefore political options. From a crisis response involving high readiness forces across the spectrum of likely tasks to a deliberate intervention involving a UK armoured brigade within a heavier US division. That concludes my remarks. Delighted to take any questions or release you back to lunch. <laughs>